All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. <coughs> Excuse me. It is September 27th, 2022. And while the rest of the world is starting to think, oh, the seven years is over. The Shemitah has started. How can this be? The seven years of tribulation we thought was going to start. We know what's coming, right? We know that people will try to push it and they're looking for other things. And all we want to tell them is say, hold on, hold fast, because it is just around the corner. We have understood the 70 years. We have understood the time of the Shemitah counts. We have understood the pre, the mid, the post, who the Gospels are speaking to, the time of the end, which is 14 years. We, we've understood it. The Spirit has been leading, and the Scriptures have revealed it. So we can take a deep breath. We still have some time, right? We know there's a little bit of time left. Probably what? What are we looking at time-wise? Anywhere starting around... Right here, as I speak to you now, we're the 27th right here. So we're what, like eight days away from Yom Kippur? Some people think Yom Kippur, if you're new to the ministry, you're going to say, what does Yom Kippur have anything to do with the escape? Well, hold on tight or go watch some of the other videos is more like it. Go watch some of the more recent videos and you'll understand how we're still in this, why we're still in this, how it could possibly be that we're in the 70th year. It's all true. The calendars are two months off, not because we made it up, but because in the beginning of man, it was in the beginning. Taurus is called the beginning. So without going all the way down through all of that, you know, a lot of people that were looking at Tishri, we've shown here in this ministry, crystal clear now to look at the months. It is so simple. This is not the Feast of Trumpets. It does not go to the third day. This was dark moon if it's dark moon on day one of the month on day one for tishri they automatically declare day two because even if they don't see the crescent of the moon it from jerusalem when the sun goes down and the moon is is there even if they don't see it on the second evening they know it's going to happen in the middle of the night when this when the moon has already gone down past them so that's why it's that day or hour, you know, when it comes to the other scriptures. We're not, we're not talking about that. We never talk about that. That's a future thing. But it's because this is always dark moon. Tishri 1, any day one of every month is always dark moon. The moon is not seen because of the sun. So day two is always the one. And that's why you have that in relation to uh, Tishri. So it is, as we speak, in fact, as we speak, they're already starting day two of Tishri, okay? And yes, it's actually day three because dark, dark, dark moon is the first day of the month. But this actually begins the week, all right? So that doesn't make when they see the crescent of the moon the, the start of the month. This is still the start of the month. This begins their weekly count. It goes week after week, month after month, year after year. It's always the same. We've said it before. The Hebrew calendar is all on target. I mean, it, it, it's all right in order with exception of, of uh, Feast of Weeks. You know, we've shown how they've misunderstood where the, how the count should be for Feast of Weeks, but that's it. And then all we've done here in this ministry, as you guys know, is we have simply, in the revelation of Taurus, slid everything over two months so that the year starts in Taurus. Okay, here's the Hebrew calendar. Here's God's calendar. Starts in the month of Taurus, which is May, June. The Jews would call it Savan, but really it's the true Nisan, according to the Lord God. Why did they do it over here? Because the sun has moved by two months over the last several thousand years. That's the only reason. That's it. All right? So... Today, we're going to cover some fun things, but uh, like as I get going, I'm going to, I'm going to show some things uh, like the very first dream, and I believe one of the only dreams I ever had that was prophetic, and you're going to see it's all about the stone's throw. We're going to touch on it a little bit because you're going to see something connected to it. It was, it was really mind-blowing for me when it happened, 
And because of how I worded it with the Lord, and, and it wasn't until the day after that I had asked that then I received this dream when the, when the time had passed. And so it was right after as if to say, no, don't do what you were going to do. I want you to understand this. And we're not going to go into all of that today. I'm just going to touch on it and share it with you guys because I'm going to show you a connection that just made me say, what? It lined up exactly to the date. It's so awesome. So we're going to go in. We're going to share some of those things. And then the bulk of what we're going to talk about today is not where I was planning on going. I was telling you guys uh, after the last one, it, actually after the last one and talking about it even a little bit before, that I was planning on doing a video in relation to the, the tribe Jesus comes from and through Joseph and, and go into all that. But we're not really going to go into that. Maybe towards the end, we'll touch on it a little bit. But we're not going to be touching on that because as I started just digging and going through some things, something else caught my attention. And it's something that we've talked about here in this ministry a lot over the years. And it has to do with this right here. We've been talking about the 50 days that begin at Yom Kippur this year that end right here that you then have the feast of ingathering when you realize, of course, remember, we're two months off, so Kislev is really Tishri. And then this being the beginning of the year, so this will be the literal 14 years beginning of tribulation right here. We have revealed and we know in this ministry that prior to the tribulation beginning, it is Luke's discourse. Luke's discourse is a period of 40 to 50 days. It's it Overall, it's a 50-day count before the 14 years begin and within that 40 day uh, that 50 day count there's the arrival of the son of man who's going to be doing signs and wonders the world is going to be against them the bride will already be gone but we know that there's workers so for the longest time i mean a long time like i don't know three years at least four years probably probably four years out of the five years i've been doing this that we have known that there's two things going on. We keep saying we either go on day one of the 50 days or we go after seven on the eighth day. Okay, this year, what does it mean for Tishri? When you understand that the calendars are two months off according to Taurus beginning, that means Tishri is actually the month, according to God, according to the sun, moon, and stars, Tishri is actually the month of Av. And we know the 9th to the 10th of Av was the time of an attack that we're looking for. Okay, that's one thing. The other part is we know the Lord's coming in the midst of the Feast of the Jews, Feast of Tabernacles, because this isn't really Tabernacles. It's the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. True Tabernacles is until down here, right? Because everything's off by two months. Kislev is really Tishri. So according to the Lord God, it's actually down here. So we, we've revealed this. We've shared so much in relation to it over the years. And in particular, recently, just exploding the understanding from John chapter 7 to Genesis chapter 7. We've shared all those things. But we've talked often about whether the bride goes on day one because we see wedding verses that when the Lord returns from the wedding, all right. I mean, you read something like that, and we know that there's seven days in between his his doing something, and which at the very least we know relates to the apostles, and we know that when he returns after seven to the eighth day is in the midst of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, and the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles is what? Seventh month, 17th day, another 717 reference to all of the other 717 references that we have just blown open here in this ministry because 717 is also Genesis 7, chapter, verse 17, which is the beginning of the 40 days son of man as his reference like the days of Noah from uh, Luke chapter 17, all right? <clears throat> We've covered these things, but today's focus is gonna be does the bride go on day one or does the bride really go on after seven sometime on the eighth day? This is something that's kind of been gnawing on us. Now, is it really a big deal? I think 
if you're not already ready and watching as I'm speaking to you from here right now, well, you got a problem, <laughs> right? You should be ready and watching, right? We, we are repentant. We are seeking him. We're diligent in him. We're baptized. If you want any info, send me an email. It's in the description box underneath. I will send you an email about it. You can come and join us in the forum over here. You can go to ministryrevealed.com, the website. Join us in the forum with like-minded brothers and sisters from all over the world. And ask your questions in there. And many people will help you out. But I will also share some info and share an email that I send out for people wanting to understand baptism and so forth. All right? It's awesome. And remember, those who go pre-trib, they're part of the spirit they have the spirit of god in them all right <clears throat> we've talked about that here in this ministry too when you go to genesis 1 when you go to john 1 the word was in the beginning right the word in the beginning it was the spirit that's genesis 1 verse 2 then the word became light that's genesis 1 verse 3 and then the light became flesh Right, We know Christ didn't become flesh until he came uh, about 2,000 years ago. However, Jesus is called the last Adam. And who was the one who became flesh? Of course, Adam was the one who became flesh in the beginning. So you had spirit, light, and flesh. Okay, We've talked about these things. It's awesome. We've got a video called The Fractal. It'll blow your mind. All of these things are about three, right? Pre, mid, post, father, son, spirit. In the end, it's going to be spirit, son, father. I mean, it's awesome stuff. So if you have any questions, just come and join us in the forum. And for anybody that's new, even though we're so close, I am going to continue to let you guys know about this intro series right here. This intro series, the Revealed okay, End Time number. Study Note. Did you say your name? Spell it. One second. The Revealed End Time Study Note series is a is a group of 11 videos but if you're new you definitely want to start at video one and i'll explain because this was the video that began it all it started back on september 8th 2017 you're going to remember that later you see there's been a lot of connections in this ministry the five-year anniversary right number of grace boom anniversary of the queen's death we uh i, I did a video on march 10th of 2020 I said to the Lord, I'm going to take this video down. It was one of the most sincere prayers and strong prayers I've ever had to the Lord. <clears throat> I was going to take it down unless I received a confirmation of a number 50 and that I was on target, that I was on track. I understood. And boom, you guys know the story. I get the email at like close to one o'clock in the morning from our sister Jodell. And everything from there was the revelation of Taurus and being right on target. You go to the very first video I ever did in june uh june 16th of 2017 and it was about the mark of the beast and that they, they they would be using pcr machines going in and out of countries that that was that was the setup because the company involved with that in developing and having these machines testing for pcr was also involved with chips and with the mark of the beast whether it be chip or tattoo and so forth and the video that was linked and the information i got on march 11th in that video was that China would catch a cold. And what happened? Bang, that afternoon, 12 hours later, global pandemic was declared just like the video that was 10 years old at the time that we had from it. So the reason I'm saying this is these connections, these connections, have we prophesied and known? No, we were teaching prophecy. This is a ministry is is revealing the word is revealing prophecy for the is to come and in the revelation of the is to come we're getting clarity of things that are since christ in the is that we're still in we're still living in the is since christ and we got greater clarity it opened up so many books and so much understanding in the gospels and it brought clarity to the was the old testament from in the beginning until christ it's been mind-blowing. But where did it all start? Right here. This is a 30-minute Bible study. And whenever you see me reading from things like this in the video, you can go into the description box and print it off yourself. 
you can go to the ministry revealed website you can get the book and you can go into greater detail you can just print it off on pdf for free it's in five languages you could buy the book if you want a paperback from amazon or you can actually just read the book from the website in english so the reason i also bring that up is because this is just an intro this is the intro to who the gospels are speaking to you're going to understand for the first time in your life that matthew mark and luke in the end of days is going to be the last shall be first the first shall be last it's going to be luke mark and matthew you're going to see why there were differences in the gospels that nobody could ever really give you an understanding to there was never a complete explanation how some things were spoken so differently and seemingly so contradictory from one gospel to the other on the same story the answer is prophecy built into the gospels and it's going to blow your mind this is a simple 30 minute intro and you're going to see things like in luke christ was arrayed in a gorgeous robe which means white radiant mark he was arrayed in purple in matthew he was arrayed in scarlet was it colorblind the people that were recounting and telling the stories about these writers and and they were all colorblind telling a different story no it was prophecy it was prophetically built in to let us know who this who the gospels were speaking to and from there watch the second intro video which is about the end time years the revelation of the years because once you understand that the gospels are speaking to different groups of people you're going to realize if you're into prophecy why there were differences in the discourses and once you understand there were differences in the discourses because they're speaking to different groups of people you're going to realize that the end of days is not one seven years one set of seven years it is two sets of seven years seven years for mark seven years for matthew seven years for the the sleeping church the the ones that maybe proclaim christ or or declare christ as their lord and savior but they're asleep they're not really in him okay let me show you a quick example i'm not going to go too far off track but for those that are new let me show you a beautiful simple example in second corinthians 12. this is a typology remember this is paul and the events that took place but there was prophecy built into the new testament more than just the discourses more than just the book of revelation it is peace here peace there it's all over the place you see this is the group in christ they go above 14 years in christ above 14 years and they're called like a rapture like a harpazo and they go to the third heaven this is what's about to happen in earlyish october and then what do you see about the mark group this is the mark group this next one it says and i knew such a man did you see that and i knew such a man not i knew a man in christ i knew such a man i knew <laughs> like a man kind of in christ is kind of what it's saying what's the difference luke's group mark's group mark's group in the he was caught up so not like looking like a rapture this one is the great multitude rapture they're going to paradise and then paul's recounting the story so he's saying hey this was above 14 years ago when it began and he's talking to them as if he's coming the third time you see the first one was a taking the second one was a taking the third one is his coming feet down it's called pre mid and post they are all true and you're going to understand that when you first begin to understand who the gospels are speaking to you'll realize it's 14 years and that's mark's discourse and matthew's discourse luke's discourse is a period of about 40 days before the 14 years begins and you're going to say this is crazy how could we have missed all this the answer is found in the third video it's a big video it is a mind-blowing opening mind video like you will have never seen before but you must first understand who the gospels are speaking to because you're going to realize oh my goodness for centuries we've been taught from the gospel of matthew but it's written to the jews it's written to judah it has nothing to do with us 
and you're going to see that all of our perspectives everybody's perspective was twisted up because we were looking through the eyes of Matthew's seven years of trumpets not realizing that Mark was the sleeping church and that Luke was his ready watching in Christ bride of Christ it's it's that crazy that's how awesome it is this fifth video you're going to see that pre mid and post are all true and you're going to see it in typologies from the triumphal entry from the transfiguration stories to his to the resurrection stories they're all typologies of pre mid and post and then you can come down here watch the 11th video and understand once and for all who the discourses are speaking to how they're different and what their timings are it's awesome you're gonna i'm telling you it'll be worth every moment of your time and we're really really close now i've said this a lot you don't have to know this you don't have to know this to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man you just have to be like 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 enoch was right you have to first have faith <coughs> that he is god you have to be diligently seeking him right watching and praying be repented turning from your ways be have the spirit within those are all the ones going and it's about 10 percent of the church it's going to be i believe exactly 144 million people but that's my opinion and i believe it's all based on when the population of the world literally hits 8 billion and i'm not just making it up because it's right around there now some some websites tell you it just passed the un says it's not quite yet and it's going to be somewhere in between i've been talking about it since it was at about 7.6 billion back four years ago this is where we are the time is now and i want to bring more connections i want to bring more excitement i want to i want to prepare and let the workers see what the lord is telling them and how i believe i'm able to start seeing now a distinction between the bride group that's gone and the workers who remain and no i don't believe that the workers are going to the wedding they're going to remain and you know one of the pieces of scripture that for a long time it, it was our brother mike at um interrupts 165 that first noticed it like probably close to three years ago two and a half years ago and it was this down here we're going to cover more of this uh more of luke 12 but in particular this place down here starting in verse 35 he says let your let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their lord when he will return from the wedding okay when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh they may open unto him immediately blessed are those servants whom the lord when he cometh shall find watching for verily i say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down and will come forth and serve them this is the first watch group these are the seals workers you see then it says and if he shall come in the second watch oh hello guess he's coming a second time isn't he or if he shall come in the third watch guess he's coming a third time isn't he pre mid and post hello you see so this group we have known for a long time is related to the group in luke chapter 24 it's the one that the the two walking on the road to emmaus that represent the disciples that are going to follow christ during his 40 days it's not only going to be two people this time i believe it's going to be two sets of twelve thousand in particular all right maybe it's more maybe it's less but i believe that that's what the revelation has shown us over the years and i've talked about that before as well now how did i know that this was connected to them well because it says that jesus when he comes he's going to sit down with them he's going to serve them and eat with them right to make them to sit down to meet and i will come forth and serve them when you go into the three synoptic gospels of luke mark and matthew and you read the lord at when he comes after his resurrection you see here the two on the road to emmaus 
you end up seeing that Jesus comes forth and serves them right here in Luke 24, 30. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, blessed it and break it and gave to them. You do not read that in, in uh, Mark's gospel. He does not sit down and eat with them. They've already eaten. They were already eating. He berates them because they weren't watching. Okay, that relates to a group at the end of seals. And um, same with Matthew. In Matthew, you don't even have this story. Okay, it's completely different. And we've gone through these things. So we've known for a long time that Luke chapter 12, when he says return from the wedding, he's talking to these guys. So when Mike first noticed that, it was kind of like one of those, uh, uh, man, are, it, 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 so what's going on? Is the bride going first? Is the bride going seven after seven days on the eighth day? Because we have scripture everywhere, including John. When we go to John's gospel, we've talked about it in the past. We go to John's gospel and at the resurrection story, he shows up to the apostles, right? Didymus Thomas wasn't there. Then he comes back eight days later. He visits and Thomas can now touch him. And then after he meets with them, what does he do? He goes to the Luke group. He goes to Luke chapter 24 and it's him meeting those disciples and the 40 days beginning. And they follow him to the end of 40 days. And then they go join where the apostles already are in the upper room. And for the longest time, this piece of scripture right here, in 24 verse 3, it says, And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you don't see any mention of it at this resurrection story. Only in Luke, or sorry, in Matthew, Mark, and John, you don't see it except in Luke. So I believe it was a clue to him when he comes at about an eight days, when he meets with these two on the road to Emmaus that become the disciples, that this was a sign of his body, his bride, okay, that was gone. And we see in, in different places, like let's go to Luke 17. In Luke 17, we've talked about this as well. And let's look at the, the characteristics of it. So he's talking his coming as lightning. So they're asking about him when he's coming in the end of days. And he says it'll be as lightning from one end to the other. We know that it relates to Matthew in Luke 17, 24. That is the Matthew reference when he comes in his day, singular day, feet down on the Mount of Olives. In verse 25, he says, but first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation? He's not talking about what he was doing back then because everything this conversation he's giving them is about prophecy, about when he comes in the end. And so it says, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days. So this is a single day at the end. This is when he comes as days that will be as the 40 days of Noah. Okay, we know the Son of Man in this ministry. We've been teaching it for over four, four and a half years. The Son of Man is coming and he's coming for 40 days. And the question was, is the bride going when he when he comes at, at the 40 days and the bride is gone? Or does the bride go first and the group that he's actually meeting with is just the worker group because the bride was already gone first? So this is the thing. When you see this, this is another thing that led me to think like when, you, when we're in uh, Luke 24. In Luke 24, when the body was gone, it was like a clue that his body was gone. His, his bride was gone. But that wasn't till the start of the 40 days. When you look at this, the craziness of the days of Noah begin at the start of 40 days at 717 in Genesis. Well, wouldn't you think tens of millions of people vanishing would instantly be causing chaos on earth? Wouldn't you think that's the thing that's going to catch the whole world off guard? Kind of makes sense to me. But you see, this here with Noah and his reference to being like Noah, which he's also a reference to as Jonah for 40 days at the beginning, it doesn't mean that it has to be because of the escape. You see, it was turmoil. It was chaos of events that were happening around the world. 
right water exploding rain falling it flooded everywhere well what do we know we know there's a stone's throw coming right a meteor asteroid whatever it is breaking up and coming down onto the earth men's hearts failing them from it that could be this chaos that he's talking about in this but first when his 40 days begin you see because recently what we started talking about is this possibility that the bride goes at the beginning of the seven days which is the beginning of the 50-day count and one of the things we see here is in genesis connection to it is for yet seven days i will cause it to rain 40 days and 40 nights but what happens during these seven days the animals are brought in the animals are brought in when they're all brought in then the door is shut right the lord shuts them in and the 40 days and the same typology of the 40 days of the son of man begins and there it is 717 just like the jews feast of tabernacles when the lord comes is in the midst of the jews feast of tabernacles and it's the seventh month 17th day on the jews calendar and genesis is 717 we've talked about that so in in looking at this again recently is there a possibility that this gathering of the animals and so forth into the ark for seven days is that a connection to the bride I, and and I don't mean the bride is going to sip a coffee. I don't mean the bride is going to be gathered up for seven days. I mean just a typology of being brought in even before the forty days begin. This is this is what we're going to dig deeper and deeper and keep going down as we get into this 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 distinction between the beginning of the fifty days and after seven days to the eighth day and the beginning of the 40 days of the son of man and so remember that that's that's where we're heading we're really going to open it up more but i want to share something else that was just shared with me okay we've taught that this is like your ninth tenth of of being off by two months it's the beginning of 50 days where does the 50 days end right here what is it it's the ethiopian jewish holiday occurring 50 days after yom kippur what do we show that the 24th was it's um it's thanksgiving which thanksgiving is in um uh, uh, uh in america and america is a representation of israel with the church and it's their thanksgiving why does it matter because the lord told us in leviticus 19 that at the year's end it was a feast of thanksgiving it was praise and worship and, and thanksgiving for the harvest. This is the date. Did, did I know it was American Thanksgiving when we realized the count? No. <laughs> it was told to me later. Well, guess what? You know what else was told to me later? What's the first day of Tishri, what we're calling the first day of tribulation that will begin 2022, the 14 years begin, on November 25th, Kislev won on the Hebrew calendar, but Tishri won to the Lord God, counting from Taurus. What is it? This was shared with me too. Black Friday. How interesting is that? A very famous, well-known day called Black Friday. They all think they're going to go shopping and everything else, and it's going to be the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation interesting right um, an, a big day in america recognized day a big day in america and a big day for a 50-day count in relation to jews returning from ethiopia all three of these days are literally connected to scripture and prophetic end time understanding so exciting i wanted to share that one with you guys now let me show you something else you see this video October 1st, 2017. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Almost five years to the date. Now, I want to share this with you because we have understood in this ministry since this time that meteors are coming. And along the way over the years has been a, a, a trying to distinguish the, the timing and, and where it's connected and all of that 
because we know it's connected to the beginning. We know that this connection, and we've taught on it recently, is from Tishri to here. And what was one of the biggest pieces of revelation to understanding its timing? Well, of course, we have Luke chapter 21, right? 25 through 28. That's one thing. Men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, right? Different than Mark's, different than Matthew's. And what else did we know? Well, we know <coughs> from the seven churches that we've also revealed that the seven churches starts with the house of, I mean, the church of Ephesus. And Ephesus is a typology relating to the true apostles, not the bad apostles, but to the true and righteous apostles that are going to be chosen. This is going to be the time when the apostles are chosen, are, are returning, and the time of great revival that's going to begin. They're receiving the Holy Ghost right away, breathed on them, the Lord visits them. That's this time right here. We've talked about it quite a bit. And before what? Well, before Smyrna's time starts. Okay? This is from the resurrection in John. This is from the resurrection in Luke. This begins the 50 days. This begins the 40 days, eight days later. And what do we know is connected to Ephesus? Right? It was, it was Diana, the goddess Diana, which is connected to Mary which is the Revelation 12, <laughs> which is when we're in Virgo. Well, guess what? We're in Virgo. We needed to be in Virgo when we realized that. It was so mind-blowing. I, uh, I told you guys I was on the phone with Mike with that one a few weeks ago when that hit me, and I just freaked right out. I knew at that time because Revelation 12 starts with the actual event of Revelation 12, one that's coming. And what is that event? It's the stone's throw. It is a meteor, asteroid, whatever it is, coming in, breaking up, and the world freaking out. And we know that it's connected to <clears throat> the goddess Diana, who was designed and built from a meteor that came and hit in Ephesus. So exciting, right? So, so awesome. We've done a bunch of teachings on that. It was such a, an exciting revelation. Well, I want to listen. I want you guys to listen to this. <clears throat> this video is October 1st, 2017. So just like what? Not quite two months after the revelation was starting to be understood. The gospels were being revealed. The 14 years was starting. I understood the 40 days of the Son of Man, that there was meteor coming. I, it, all of it was starting to pour out. I mean, when I think back on this time, oh, man. I, I was crying so much. You would have thought I was some big wuss or something. I was in tears with my wife probably every two to three days because of the amount of revelation I was getting as it was all opening. I was freaking out. And it lasted at least a year. Not not crying quite as much as that, but just trying because I was just trying to take it all in, you know, and I, I was freaking out at everything. I would read it and I would understand it and I knew where it went. And I, oh! <laughs> So there's a lot of memories even listening to this, but I want you guys to listen to the description of it and when it happened. Listen to this. Check this out. The dream when I woke up this morning, I remembered it. It was me and my wife. We were, it looked like it was probably New York. There were some big tall buildings in the background and the skies opened up and these. It doesn't mean it was New York. It could have been New York. It could have been San Francisco, something like that. But it, I, I was leaning to New York, just so you know massive meteors or comets or whatever they were some of them were huge one in particular was the biggest one there was another one that was really big and then a bunch of smaller ones i'd say maybe 8 10 12 something like that and they were coming through kind of clustered together they weren't touching each other but they were all within the same kind of bulky area of the sky and i didn't see any coming around on the left or the right but i just saw that direction they were beige in color they looked like sand color they weren't all fiery but there was like a trail behind them because the speed obviously that they're coming through and i could see that where they were going to come down i saw as soon as they were breaking out of the clouds and i saw them i knew they were going to where the water was and that city that the background that i could see in front of the water was it looked like new york it was a big city and it was heading down it was full speed ahead and it was massive one another really big one and then some smaller ones and when i say smaller i mean they were still probably like apartment building size like small apartment building size whereas the massive one was really really big it was it was more oval shaped they were all kind of oval shaped and I turned to my wife and like I said, it looked like a big city, like it could have been New York and it was heading into the water, kind of coming down a little bit in my vision from left to right, falling from the sky, coming in at a slight angle down to the lower right. 
But when I had seen it, it was still up in the sky coming quickly. And we all start panicking. I grab my wife and I say, we got to run to the mountain. So that was the, the really the one and only dream I know that I had that was a prophetic dream. And the reason I'm telling you this is because the video I'm talking on here was done on October 1st. And the dream was the evening before. So last night, what happened, I wasn't planning on sharing this. I've talked about it in the past, but last night as I was in prayer and just talking with the Lord here in the garage, as I do, <clears throat> usually later in the evening, I suddenly had this idea of this video and I thought, wait a second, when did I have that dream? So I went back to look what was, I guess, September 30th of 2017. And I went back to look to see what was, there's October 1st. What was September 30th, 2017? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. What were we talking about, brothers and sisters? The 50 days beginning at Yom Kippur. And what are we expecting during this seven to the eighth day? The true Revelation 12 sign of meteors coming. Just as it did with Ephesus during her time and what Diana was created from. And what does our timing begin at? Yom Kippur. How's that for timing? Remember I was telling you earlier? That'll be what exactly? That'll be exactly five years like there was five years of grace. I started the ministry on September 8th, 2017. What happened on September 8th, 2022? The queen died and signaling this, this whole talk, this whole big conversation being revived about 70 years again. Then, of course, what I was telling, you know, the very first video I did, um, what, what was so important about the very first video I did is that it was in June on the 16th, 17th of June. What's the 16th, 17th of June? Taurus. What what happened in in March of 2020? I do the video <clears throat> on the 10th. I post it at night. I said, "Lord, I'm going to take down the video." So really early in the morning on the 11th at like one o'clock in the morning, I get this incredible confirmation. 12 hours later, the video that was talked about in that in that confirmation that was given to me along with the right on target was that China caught a cold and it would go into global pandemic, nations would be shut down. And the very first video I did in 2017, that was in June, starting in Taurus, was about them using PCR machines, testing people coming in and out of for con in and out of countries. And that guy's video was talking about the same type of thing that it was all planned by the powers that be. You see? And so I go to look at that video and I find out <clears throat> five years to the date is the beginning of our 50 day warning. Is the beginning of the 50 days when everything on earth is going to change. Now listen to this. Check this one out. Today and the screensaver that was there for this video was this image right here. I'd never seen it. So it was there the whole time during the video. And I saw this and this is I was like, what? Wait a second. I, I know what this is. This was my dream. That big one that I described in that video, this is what it looked like. Oval in shapes, sandy color looking because of graininess too. And I don't know in the video if I talk about the band, but when I told my family about it, I said that there was a band going around the middle of it. And it reminded me of a bath bomb. That's what I told my family. Well, check this out. See this? There's your bath bomb. Not this kind of bath bomb so much, right? This is round and it's got one jetting out. This was what I saw. It looked a lot like this. Gritty, grainy, but sand color. I've been requesting another, other. You see? So I freaked out because... I mean, when was this? This was November 27th, <coughs> excuse me, 2017. I had never seen of these. I'd never heard of them before. And I saw this image show up on, on one of the YouTube video feeds. And when I saw it, I said, what on earth? This is what I saw in my dream. <coughs> excuse me, but a lot bigger, obviously. They were massive in size. And it was grainy sand. It was kind of oval with a band going through it. This was literally what I saw in my dream. 
And about a little less than two months later, I was shown exactly what I had described to my family <clears throat> and what was in the video. So I think it's probably safe to say what we're going to see coming at the five-year anniversary connected to Yom Kippur. <clears throat> Guys, I didn't even realize it. This is the wheelhouse where we're talking about this. So I wanted to share that with you guys as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me close these off. It was just so exciting to, to realize, you know, to be in prayer with the Lord. And, and just all of a sudden it comes to my thoughts and I'm like, wait a second. <clears throat> and to turn out, it's literally that. Let me now share something else with you guys. We're going we're gonna to start going into this to this, are we going beginning of 50 now, right? Is the bride going here or is the bride going here? And like I had said earlier, <clears throat> excuse me. Like I had said earlier, this is something we'd been going back and forth on for such a long time. And so I think tonight I'm going to be able to bring much more clarity to it. And I'm going to start with something that uh, one of our brothers, Scott, shared with me. He was sending me a bunch of private messages in the forum. Uh, again, like I said, you can come join us in the forum, like-minded brothers and sisters, watching and praying and seeking the Lord, sharing all sorts of info from around the world, scriptures, studies, all sorts of things. Well, he started going into Psalms 18 because he had noticed also that Psalms has 50 verses. And Psalms to us, I've been talking about Psalms for a long time for those that don't know we have what's called these books that have opened up to us all of these books have opened up to us with within them seeing typologies of events in the coming end of days so within these chapters there's events like let me give you an, an easy example in the seventh year of seals which is the time of the great multitude rapture in john 14 Jesus is saying, hey, I go to prepare a place that when I return, I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What happens? He's returning at the end of the sixth seal, and in the time of the seventh year of seals, he, the rapture group, great multitude, is being brought to him in paradise, as I showed you earlier, is where the great multitude is going to paradise to be with the Lord. Because he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. So... <clears throat> Without going into a whole bunch of these, that's what happens in these chapters all throughout Scripture. A couple verses here or there, or sometimes it could be the entire piece of uh, the entire chapter. And what you find out is sometimes it could be describing something at the beginning of the year. It might be something at the end of the year. It might be something throughout that year. It's discernment of events going on throughout that year and we have done this we have been showing this and breaking it down and adding more books as we've gone more into the into the torah we brought all these books through and it continued to develop as we got better and better in the understanding as we were drawing deeper and continued to dig further and further into the word and <clears throat> when it started though it started with psalms Okay, Psalms for a long time was known to be uh, a chapter to years of events that were happening. And they believed they had it from about 1900, but they couldn't understand beyond 1900 um, to 2000. And I had discovered that it was chapter 18 to 33, or you can go 118 to 133. And what you found were these events within them that were relating to the events coming in the years to come. And uh, what a lot of people do is they'll say, oh, see, well, we're in 2022, so it should be chapter 22 or 122. <clears throat> it's not true, it's not how it works. It's whenever it starts. You know, at one point I thought it was gonna be 1718. And then I thought it was gonna be 2018, <clears throat> 2019. 2019, 2020, because we kept trying to understand where the 70th year of the Lord was going to end. And now we have it. And what you see here is this is before the tribulation begins. Meaning these events right here 
take place before the 14 years begin on Kislev 1 Hebrew calendar or true Tishri 1 on the Lord God's calendar. That begins right here. So what do we see in Psalms 18? You see, we've known, like I said, Psalms for a long time. And after Psalms, we started to grow in the understanding in the prophets in relation to Hosea and Zechariah. Then started to realize John. And then Acts. And then from Acts, we started getting a whole bunch in the Old Testament. And now we've gone from the beginning of the book to the end with these books that have revealed themselves with chapters and years in these events. But Psalms was the beginning. And it just so happened that the book of Psalms, you know, after we had discovered this, it was, I had an email sent to me. I don't know if it was like six months or a year later. I had an email sent to me that there was something called the Psalms of Ascent. And from the Septuagint, it starts in 19 or, or 119, whatever it was. And it goes for 15 verses. Or sorry, 15 chapters. And they were the Psalms of Ascent. It was perfect. We had already had it. It was so awesome. You see, we get confirmations like that all the time. We talked about it in the last video. Just like this. We got the revelation of Taurus being the beginning. The Spirit gave us the word on that one. Kept searching and searching and searching. And then come to find out the Jews knew that Taurus was the first constellation in the Zodiac the whole time. <laughs> you know, and you're like, what? So what happens in Psalms 18? Well, guess what? We're still in the seventh year. We're still in the 70th year. Which means the events in Psalms 18 are going to happen before the beginning of the 14 years in tribulation in late November this year. So we go to Psalms 18, and I'm going to show you some things with words. This is kind of like starting to, to bring you in to seeing this, this, what's looking like the bride going first. And then seeing another group still here relating to something else, which would be the worker group. And I'm going to show you, I've talked in the past even about who the workers were or or the, the people that they are. Not directly who they are, but the type of people that they are. All right? So look at what it says. In Psalms 18, verse 1, remember, there's 50 verses. Is there possibility that there's even a verse two days going on for the 50 days. It's possible. Our, our brother Scott's been going further down that. I haven't gone down that too much, except let me show you one that I found and I sent him. <clears throat> but I'm not saying yay or nay. But listen to this. 48th verse would be like the 48th day. It says, He delivered me from mine enemies. Yea, thou lifteth me up above those that rise up against me thou hast delivered me from the violent man so what do you have one two three days when is the violent man coming when is the the spirit of antichrist antichrist isn't going to be revealed right away but when is the spirit of antichrist as the raven being sent out well the 40 days of the son of man from from 717 in the midst of tishri ends right here and you got what? One, two, three days. <clears throat> so what would be the 48th day? Right there. All right, goes like this. So the 48th day would be right here. This is the end of the 40 days of the Son of Man. And guess what happens when we go back to Genesis? What happens when the, the 40 days are over in Genesis 8? What do we see in verse 6? And it came to pass at the end of the 40 days that Noah opened the window. See, it came to pass at the end of 40 days, which means the next day. And what does it say? He opened the window and he sent forth the raven. What's the raven? The raven is the dusky hue. That's because of the skin color. And what's the dusky hue mean? Arab. The texture of their skin, the color of their skin. The Antichrist is going to be an Arab. We've talked about it many times. So isn't that interesting? 
just that just that one little thing on its own let alone the rest of the things i still got to look at that scott found and show how it all relates in this possibility with these 50 days well look at what happens in verse one he found this in psalms 18 verse one it says and he said i will love the lord my strength okay so he's calling the lord his strength in verse two it says the lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my god my strength in whom i trust my my buckler and my horn uh, sorry in the horn of my salvation and my high tower look at this there he is strength there and there he is strength there so he's called the rock huh aren't we waiting for a rock to come aren't we waiting for a rock to come do you see how the rock is actually in verse two well if you caught this as i was showing you guys my dream in 2017 was on the 10th of tishri but it was in the evening so it was really you'd have to say here because this was october 1st in uh 2017 and i was doing the video right here in 2017 according to the hebrew calendar numbers right and my dream was right here so this is day one of 50 this is day two of 50. What happens when we get to day two of 50? It says the Lord is my rock, okay? My rock, a ragged stone, okay? We know that a stone is coming, connected to the sometime in that eight days, of which according to, uh, if it's potentially confirmed to my dream time-wise, is verse two. And look at what it says for my strength. <clears throat> my deliverer, my God, myself, uh, my strength. Look at what it says a rock or a boulder so when the lord is coming and they're going to see this he is the rock right it's very probable that christ is coming as the one who threw it he's represented as that rock but we know he's literally going to be here too now this is the word for strength it's called a rock what is the word for strength being called rock <laughs> well we know the word strength is used all throughout the old testament as well so what happens if we go to the first one first verse as day one of the 50 and look at what it is it's completely different it's 2391 it means help and it's used one time what does help come from let's see where help is to seize do you know that that's a definition for harpazo the definition for harpazo, you know, a lot of people like, oh, there is no rapture in the word. Oh, yeah, there's harpazo in Greek. And harpazo means to rapture. What does harpazo mean? What does rapture mean? It means to, I, I always remember he hearing somebody tell this story that um, they, I think it might have been Perry Stone many years ago, <laughs> asking an old Greek guy in Greece, what does the word harpazo mean? And he explained by saying, you know, you see a little girl walking out into the street and right there's a car coming and you grab her by the hair and you pull her back as fast as you can he says that's harpazo it's to seize by force and isn't that interesting that this word for strength comes from the word to seize but it also means what help so the lord is my help the lord is my strength my help to seize and look at this word help this word help is only used one time, and guess what? Do you know that we have scripture that talks about the Lord being a helper, right? This is what our brother had shared with me. We go to Hebrews chapter, what was it, 13? I think that was 13, 13, six. In Hebrews 13, verse six, here it is. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear, what man shall do unto me look at the word helper one time <laughs> see that is to call to cry he's our helper so is it possible in this beginning as we're going down this trail is it possible is there is there something here that is leaning to have us think that it's possible that 
day one of the 50 is the escape. Help, seize, right? He is our helper, seizing us. And then you see a rock and the strength of the rock, the deliverer coming. So if the bride's gone on day one, you got to see something. You see, <clears throat> look at what comes next. When the rock comes, isn't it going to start to bring some chaos? It's going to start to bring some chaos. Now, it's not going to fall right away. <clears throat> We're going to see it coming. Or those who are on the earth who remain, if the escape is on day one, will see it coming. Chaos is going to break out. Looting and craziness would start pretty close, right? At least to some extent when they see this coming. And then consider that tens of millions of people have vanished. Now it starts to make sense that sorrows of death compassed me about. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. All right? In my distress, I call upon the Lord out of his temple. Well, if the bride is gone at the beginning, then who are the ones calling out? Okay? The earth shook and trembled. There went smoke out of his nostrils, fire out of his mouth devoured. He bowed the heavens and came down. Darkness And darkness was under his feet. He rode upon the cherub and did fly. Yes, he did fly on the wings of the wind. And then what do we see? We keep coming down here. We see the channels of water were seen and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke. You understand that regardless of whether this plays out from day one of 50 or a little bit further that this is going to be during the 50 days, this is going to happen starting sometime in early mid-ish October to the end of November. Because we are still in the seventh year of the Shemitah of the 70th of Israel. There's no way around it. There's no, there's no looping. There's no add another two or three. It doesn't exist. So then look what it says in verse 16. He sent from above and took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, uh, from them which hated me, <clears throat> for they were too strong for me. He prevent, they prevented me in the day of my calamity. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to the righteousness, uh, according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He hath recompensed me. Well, then who's this group? If the first group is the rapture, then who is this group that he's rescuing out of all of this chaos that is broken out? during the first seven or eight days or so to when he comes and then the stone hits well let's keep going it says for i have kept the ways of the lord for all the judgments <clears throat> were before me i was upright uh let's keep going <clears throat> psalms 18 verse 27 for thou wilt save the afflicted people hello Right? Tribulation is about to begin. It will be tribulation, but it really hasn't officially begun. But in a sense, it has, okay? Because the escape and everything has happened. Um, for thou will save the afflicted people, okay? Uh, but will bring down high looks, for thou will light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Isn't that what we talk about? When Christ comes, we've been talking about it so much lately, that when Christ comes, he's coming to bring light into the darkness from the attack, from the chaos. Well, now look at what happens. Verse 29. For by thee, I have run through a troop. And by my God, have I leapt over a wall. Hello. This isn't no bride group that's been taken. This is a group that stayed, that were given protection. It says, for who is God save the Lord and who is the rock save our God? See, there's that connection again, right? The Lord God Father against the rock Jesus. And listen to what they can do. Verse 33 and 34. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places 
he teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken in my arms. Hello. This is a group of workers during seals that have power, that have authority, being given to them by the Lord who came. So that clearly doesn't have anything to do with the rapture group, the, the pre-trib escape group. For those that don't know, I, I call pre-trib, we call it the escape, all right? So it doesn't get confused with people that say the rapture. That's why Paul said it was like a rapture. And then there is the rapture, all right? So we can clearly see that if the Lord had come down on a cherub, yes, he did fly. And this group is here and he's rescuing them from all this distress of these events taking place. And now these guys got power and authority from them. Hello. Clearly, they're the worker group. So is it possible that on day one, this is the pre-trib escape of the bride? <clears throat> well, let's see. Let's go a little bit further. This is what we were talking about here uh, in Luke chapter 12 earlier. But what we're going to do is we're going to go a little further back into Luke chapter 12. We're not going to start right there at that point. We're going to see what he's telling this group of people um, at that part when he says to wait for their Lord when he returns. Listen to what it says, starting in verse 4. I say unto you, my friends. Okay, isn't that interesting? I say unto you, my friends. <clears throat> Why is this important? Because we know... When you go to the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7, we know that the story of the 144,000 that are sealed here, you can see, we see that there's no Ephraim and there's no, uh, or sorry, there's no Ephraim and there's no Dan. Okay, Levi steps in for Dan and Joseph steps in for uh, Ephraim. Because you can see, you still have Manasseh there, right? So these are the 144,000 that are sealed. But we know Dan's not represented there and neither is Ephraim. And we showed in Luke in Luke 24, the two on the road to Emmaus. And when you understand historical events that took place, there were two groups of 12,000 that were following a rabbi. And I believe that these two groups of 12,000 were a typology in the is to come as well of Dan and Manasseh that are missing from the 144,000 because they are the seals workers. We've talked about that the in the past with um, with uh, 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 Priscilla and Aquila. Aquila means eagle. That is the good side of Dan that overcame. Okay, we've talked about these before. I believe that these two are the ones that relate to the workers. And the reason I say friends is, and the reason I was sharing that is because Jesus in John 15, which in the typology, remember those chapters to years? This is the beginning of trumpets. And Jesus talks about, you know, no greater love is there than you are my friends. If you do what I say, remain, uh, no greater love hath no man uh, than this that a man laid down his life for his friends. He's calling the, this is the typology in here, the grapes, where he's talking to the 144,000 being called his friends, and he's willing to put his life on the line for them, which we know happens during the time of trumpets because of something that some of them do. So if he's calling the 144,000 his friends, they were given to him by the Father, and there's two of them missing that we know there are two represented during the time of seals, then it would make sense that if these guys are his friends, it would make sense that those in Luke chapter 12 that represent this smaller group are also being called his friends. You'll see it's a smaller group too. And so back to Luke 12 verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more than they can do. But I forewarn you whom you should fear, fear him who can throw the body, uh, uh, the spirit into hell later. Um, uh, verse six, five sparrows sold, two farthlings. Verse seven, he goes on to say, 
in verse 7, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, uh, fear not, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Who are the ones with their hairs that are numbered? Not a hair on their head will be touched. Those who put on their necks on the line, right? Those who die during the time of seals, at the time when the Antichrist comes, when they start going after the Christians. Some of these guys are going to be put to death, which is exactly what we read in Luke 21 with those that some of them are going to be put to death. These are the Smyrna workers. Uh, keep going into verse 8. And I say unto you, whomsoever shall confess, confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But him that blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Listen to this, verse eleven and twelve. And when they bring you before, uh, bring you unto synagogues and unto magistrates, and powers, that ye take no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. Hello. This is Seals events. He's talking to a group he calls his friends. Then what does he say next? Um, and one from the company said unto him, Master, uh, speak to my brother uh, about the inheritance. Okay, let's keep going from that one. He goes again in verse 22, speaking to the disciples again. And he says unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither the body what you shall put on the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment now let me ask you this do you think there are people in christ who love the lord that are ready and watching that are going to go pre-trib that somewhere around the world they're not they're not tight on funds they're not afraid and, and worried and anxious about where their next meal is going to come from in some poor country living in a hut but love the Lord with all their heart? Do you not think that this is happening to people all over the world and has been for 2,000 years? Of course, there's people all over the world that are in Christ that, that are afraid and, and not knowing where their next meal is going to come from, and some still die. This is prophecy. He's speaking to a specific group of people, clearly a specific group, and not to everybody that's his in Christ. Can it be applied to daily life and so forth? Sure. But we live pretty comfortably compared to other parts of the world, don't we? There are other parts of the world where it is something they have to consider all the time. That's because prophetically, this is speaking to a group of people that are his disciples in the is to come. Uh, listen to what he says, continuing 24. He says, consider the ravens. For they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. The God feeds what is better than the fowls. Uh, verse 25. And which of you, with taking thought, can add anything to your stature? Okay. So he's letting them know during this time when they're going to work during seals, don't fear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't let that be a thought to consider or even be concerned about. Don't worry about the clothes on your back. Don't worry about any of those things. Because as a worker, as a disciple for the Lord during seals, you are protected. You will be fed. He will do whatever miracles he's going to do that you will always be provided for as you continue to be in him and bringing those to the truth of Christ during the time of seals. In verse 29, And seek ye not, what you shall eat and what you shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth what you have need that you have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure 
to give you the kingdom. Sound familiar? For it is the father's, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do we know somebody who gets kingdom, who who rules and reigns with the Lord during the millennial reign? We do, don't we? We do, don't we? We'll talk about that a little bit more. So remember this. There is a little flock that are his disciples during the time of seals that shouldn't fret over these things, but just continue to seek the kingdom of God and adding to it. And he will add these things unto you, little flock. And in the end, he's going to give you the kingdom. Who's this little flock? Hello. A group of believers. The little flock is a group of believers called disciples who will be given the kingdom. Starting even just in this little piece right here, it's quite telling, isn't it? Because listen to what he keeps going on to say. So you'll totally understand who he's talking to. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that fails not. Where no thief approacheth. Neither moth corrupteth, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I am not telling you to go sell everything you have. (laughs) I've never told anybody to do that. If you feel that's what you need to do and the Lord is doing that, then hallelujah, go do it. I am saying this was the Lord telling them. This was the Lord telling them. I am looking at this and I'm telling you, This is the Lord having a conversation with his disciples when? Right around here. We know. Of course, we know that he meets with the apostles. But if the escape happens here, is it possible that he's also letting the disciples know as well? Is it possible the disciples and the apostles are connected here? And what are what are the disciples going to have to do? Well, we know the apostles are receiving the anointing and they're going to start doing their work. <coughs> but the disciples, they're told to hunker down and wait till he returns from the wedding. We just saw in Psalms 18, this craziness that takes place. And then he shows up on the wings of a cherub. And he rescues a group that just had to go through a whole bunch of devastation that were starting to come upon the earth. And he rescues them. You see? Worker group. So look at what it says. So if this is where it starts and the worker group is also being told with the apostles, (coughs) excuse me, but the apostles receive the anointing right away. These guys are told to wait till the Lord returns from the wedding. Well, look at what happens. This was all the instructions he's giving them. He's giving them the instructions, letting them know to prepare. Don't don't turn away. Stay in me. Don't worry about these other things in the world. Prepare and be ready for what? Verse 35. He's continued talking. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And your lights burning. Because it's the time of light, isn't it? And your lights burning. For you yourselves, like unto men, that wait for their Lord (coughs) when he will return from the wedding. And I shared with you in the beginning how this related directly to the resurrection story of Luke, which is connected to the 40 days when he will return from the wedding (coughs) and he will serve this first group. This group is his little flock group of believers that will be here during seals. And if he has given them these instructions, and as he comes to an end with giving these instructions, what does he tell them? As your Lord when he returns from the wedding. Well, like I said earlier, when Mike first brought that up about three years ago, 
you suddenly realize, well, if that's related <clears throat> to when he comes at about an eight days, which is after a seven day wedding, which is which is the story of the ark, which is yet seven days. And then it says, and after seven days, the 40 days begin. What is after seven days? It's sometime on the eighth day. So if he's telling the group of workers, which are clearly absolutely being discussed about the little flock that represent those disciples, because that's the only one that he sits with eat and eats. If he's telling it to them when he returns from the wedding, then he must be talking with them here and giving them comfort and preparing them. But they got to hang out and be strong until and be ready. So that when he returns after the wedding and he knocks, <clears throat> they had better be ready. Hello. That's exciting stuff. Now, let's start to distinguish this. He's talking about when he returns from the wedding. So let's go to Luke chapter 14. We, we've done a, a video not too long ago. and We've touched on other pieces of this recently. You see, only in Luke. This is very important. This is something else that struck me today. Only in Luke do you have one, the wedding feast, and then two, the parable of the great banquet. When you go to Matthew chapter 22, you only have the parable of the wedding feast. Of course, both parables are different. Of course they're different, right? Because one is a pre-trib one, one is a post-trib one. That's why you see the, the one that comes in, what does he say to the friend, garment, throws him out with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Who are those thrown out with weeping and gnashing of teeth? Matthew 28, right? At the end of tribulation is that reference. So, and you even see here, it says, a certain king which made a marriage for his son. What marriage is this that we know of? It's the one at the end of tribulation. Remember, there's two brides. There's a Leah and there's a Rachel. And what do we know about this one? <clears throat> what is this bride all about? This bride is the one from Genesis, uh, Revelation 21. Right? This is New Jerusalem coming down at the end of tribulation. When it's all over and even when the millennial reign is done. That big picture. Here comes New Jerusalem. We talked about in the last video. Represents the 12 gates, which are the 12 tribes. <clears throat> the 12 foundations, which are the 12 apostles. And the wall, which is 144 cubits, which represents the 144,000. So you have the apostles that are the seals workers as well, with the seals workers, right? The apostles are working during the time of seals. As as spiritual foundation layers the wall is being built and represented as the spiritual wall being built during trumpets and then you've got the 12 gates which are the 12 tribes which are the workers that are gone out during the millennial reign again something we've spoken about and we see from um from matthew's gospel that we see they go out remember in matthew 28 they're no longer preaching the Lord. They're going out and teaching the ways of the Lord because now he's here until the end of the world. Did you catch it? I caught it just yesterday. Remember, these guys, these are the 12 tribes working during the millennial reign. They're the ones from, Luke, uh, from Matthew 28 when he says, I'm here until the end of the world, and they're going to go out and teach. They're the gates through which those around the world will come and honor the Lord at their appointed times. These are the tribes that are going to teach the ways. They're here during the millennial reign. Wasn't that interesting? Somebody else is here during the millennial reign with the Lord as well, isn't there? Those from the first resurrection. Those who put their necks on the line, a specific group of people who put their necks on the line during seals. They're here during the millennial reign. But they're not sent out anywhere. Hello. 
during the millennial reign while the lord is here and these people that are resurrected who are ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years they're not the gates they're not the ones going out teaching the ways of the lord no 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 their reward is what their reward is the kingdom isn't that right their reward is the kingdom that's what luke 12 told us just do what you're supposed to do stay in the lord keep keep bringing them in prepare the people <coughs> and right my little flock and my father it'll be my father the father's pleasure to give you the kingdom because they're going to be what ruling and reigning with christ for a thousand years they're not working during the thousand years the 12 tribes are working during the thousand years as the gates through which everybody's going to come in to honor the lord but this little group right here this little flock this little group of believers he's going to reward them with the kingdom and they're going to rule and reign with them for a thousand years guess what who are they this group right here the first watch so clearly there's got to be something before the 40 days of the son of man when he returns from the wedding and if we know that there's a wedding that comes first which is a gentile one you could say that gentile bride which is the typology of leah hello what other wedding is it supposed to be so let's see now if we can continue to bring more clarity to this sorry just a moth came on my desk all right get out of here so now let's go back to this whole thing with the wedding feast compared to a great banquet this wedding feast is obviously also spoken of very differently than the one with Ma than matthew and of course mark doesn't have any wedding feast so what do we see in luke's wedding feast that we've taught on a very important piece that we talked about a lot right and you're going to see this distinction right here in in uh luke 14 starting in verse 8 when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, okay? Don't go sit up in the preem preeminent place of meals and of reclining. Don't go sit up in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. We've talked about this a lot, right? I, want, I wanted to make sure that that at least everybody going in this ministry, everybody that we may be accounted worthy to escape and go pre-trib, that we're not going to go run to get the highest rooms and sit in the highest place. We're going to sit in the back of the room in the lowest level and let the Lord do what he will. All right? We've talked about it many times. And then it says, um, And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he bade thee, uh, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher, then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Okay? What you read next in the parable of the banquet is not the same as the wedding it's another story about when you have a when you have a banquet when you're going to invite people don't invite family and friends go out and get the lame and everybody else right our family and friends are just going to rebuke they're going to come against they don't want to listen to anything you have to say <laughs> so go get the lame right go get the lame the blind the maimed the poor and listen to what the Lord says. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed, listen to this, at the resurrection 
of the just. Who are those that take place in a resurrection who would be going out and bringing in the blind and the lame and, and the poor and so forth? We just saw it, didn't we? In Revelation chapter 20. We talked on this not too long ago. We see in, Re whoops, we see in Revelation 20 where it talks about the thousand years and it says the souls of them that were beheaded, right? Those who put their necks on the line, just like Priscilla and Aquila, the seals workers representation, neither received the mark on their foreheads and their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years and the rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Who are the ones that will take place in the first resurrection? Who gets to be a part of this resurrection who we just saw over in 12 that that were a small flock that would be go out going out and working during the time of seals that will be rewarded at the resurrection what was their reward at the resurrection the kingdom would be given to them see verse 15 luke 14 verse 15 and when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things he said unto him blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of god this is the reference to the seals workers well what about this group what about this one that bade him uh to a wedding and it says sit not down in the highest room what was the word for highest room it was this reclining, having this preeminence at meals. So it clearly is a special group, right? Not just a bunch of people that are only going to be left in the lower room. Of course, there's going to be people in the lower rooms and the medium rooms, but there will also be a special group of people <coughs> going to the highest room, which means at a party, right? A party at a meal, reclination. They're, they're going to be, <coughs> excuse me, the honored guests or the, the ones that have preeminence at this meal. At what meal? At the wedding. So wait a second. If this is a group brought to a wedding, and there's a group at the wedding that's going to have preeminence, as well as those sitting in the lower room, well, then who is this group? These are the workers. So that must mean this group at the wedding feast is the pre-trib group going to the third heaven that will be part of the pre-trib escape at the wedding. Where did this word come from, right? This These that get the honor in the highest room. Well, we know this pretty well as well, don't we? In Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, let's look at this story. It's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Well, I want you guys to see something. Starts in verse 10. It says, And the apostles, when they were returned. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? When did the apostles' time begin? And the apostles, when they were returned. So we're looking at this prophetically, right? This typology with the end time understanding. Well, we know this is the beginning of the, the resurrection story of John when he meets with the 12 apostles first. And it goes on to say, uh, da, 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 told them all that they had done and he took them and went aside privately. Um, when they knew it, followed him. And the people, when they knew it, followed him and he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God. We see the, the story of the feeding with the loaves and the fishes. In verse 14, he says, for they were about 5,000 men, and he said to them, uh, and he said to his disciples, take them and sit down by fifties in a company. There's the word. There's the word. What was this word from? Those from the wedding that got preeminence to go into the upper room, to go into the highest room. So this group here, is a typology. This is all a typology. 
it starts at the time of the apostles that are returned there's disciples there with them and in this case he's talking about a company that has preeminence at a meal just like the one at the wedding remember we're looking through the end time eyes and you're going to see why this is important then he goes on to say down to verse 18 it came to pass and he was alone praying his disciples were with him and he asked them saying who say the people that i am they answered said john the baptist some say to lie some say elias and others say uh that one of the old prophets is risen again and he says unto them but who do you say that i am peter answering said the christ of god and he straightway charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing okay so we're seeing a a typology here (coughs) of being in heaven and this banquet of this this wedding feast taking place by the fact of those who got to sit in the highest room receiving their meal yes there's the typology of disciples and apostles that are there but remember we're looking at typologies these little clues that are typologies of events taking place and he goes on to say <clears throat> and he straight, straightway charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing and what does he say in verse 22 the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chiefs and of the scribes and slain and raised the third day does this sound familiar that he must suffer many things and be rejected it's it's like he's he's just about ready to show up The 40 days of him coming in the midst of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, when he begins his 40 days and he must be rejected, you see, we know these are events that took place. But when you have end time understanding and the Gospels are speaking to different groups, you can pick up clues as to why some words are in one and not in the other. Why some stories that even though they're supposed to be the same story are written completely differently. And there's clues within the words that don't even line up because they're only used one time for that person, for that one group. We're seeing the story of a group at the wedding feast and him having a conversation of he's he's about to come back and he's going to be rejected. This is like he was telling them. It's almost like what he's doing here is having this prophetic conversation like he was having in Luke 17. That the Son of Man must first suffer, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. The same typology is taking place. And then he says, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Hello. Who's going to follow them? The seals workers, right? So we have this typology. Now the time of seals hasn't started yet. I mean, uh, the 40 days of the Son of Man hasn't started yet. This is, again, a a, a preparation conversation taking place during that seventh to the eighth day. He says, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what man is advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Verse 26, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the son of man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. (coughs) Excuse me. But I tell you the truth. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. What is all this conversation about? It's all taking place in the portion called above eight days, Uh, uh, you know, during the seven days, during this wedding feast taking place, during a conversation with apostles, (coughs) a conversation with disciples, 
it might even be that the conversation starts at the beginning of the eight days, at the beginning of the first day of the 50 days. Like the entire conversation is taking place at that moment on day one when he's here and he he anoints the apostles and the disciples are there and they're receiving understanding. And at the same time, we know there's a relation because a wedding is about to take place for seven days in heaven. So he anoints them. He has this conversation. He tells the disciples to be ready when he returns from the wedding. He tells them about all these things first. He's anointed the apostles. The apostles are anointed, then go and do their thing. And then what happens? Then he, in Luke 9, verse 28, remember I told you, if you go see the story of pre, mid, and post, you're going to see the story of pre, mid, and post in the transfiguration stories, the resurrection stories, and the triumphal entry stories of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so what do we see? And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. It came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. Do you know when you go to Mark and Matthew, you don't get any of that? <clears throat> We've talked about it many times. Look at what Mark is. After six days, what does it mean? It means after six years is the typology in seals. What does it mean in Matthew? Matthew also says, <coughs> excuse me, after six days. Why? Because it's the reference to after six years of trumpets. So when you go back to Luke, again, something we've talked on many times about it is that it came to pass about in eight days as a dual meaning. It is a typology of actual days meaning after seven, about in eight days. Remember the story of the ark? They're about to, they start getting in on day one and it's not till after seven days. What is it with John? That would mean on the eighth day is the 40 days starting. <clears throat> what happened in John's gospel? He meets with them. He's gone. He returns after eight days. And then what? Meets with Didymus. And then on the same eighth day, he goes and meets with Luke's group and the 40 days begin. What does that mean? When we look on the calendar, there's day one. So this entire conversation could be taking place right here on day one, and then he's returning what? Well, there's day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Everything says after seven at the time of about an eighth day, so sometime in the eighth day. <laughs> here he comes, returning at the eighth day. And we've got it all over the place. But guess what? It's a little bit more than that at the same time, isn't it? Because just like Mark's that says six days is a typology of six years and the Lord returning on heavenly Mount Zion, we also have then six years of trumpets when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. So I'm, I've taught on this and I've explained it many times. For the longest time, I was scratching my head on why Luke's was about in eight days. You see, nobody could tell you by saying it was just a, a frame of reference, like, oh, uh, Luke was just, you know, uh, I don't know, seeing it from a different stand viewpoint. No. Two of them say after six days, he says about in eight days. There's no saying, oh, well, it means a different viewpoint. No. This is a crystal clear discrepancy in scripture, right? Unless you've been given the key to unlock who the gospels are speaking to, which you get, as I showed you in the beginning, by going to understand that intro series and who the gospels are speaking to. So if the other ones relate to years, this one should also relate to years. We know it relates to days as well in this case, but how does it relate to years? Well, this is how it relates to years. There's your seven-year Shemitah cycle. Yes, we're still in it according to the Lord God's count. And then what does that mean? Well, that means what? 50 days or, or 43 days before the eighth year starts. The eighth year is what? 
the next Shemitah cycle. So what is it? It's about an eighth year. It's just about the eighth year that's about to start. But it's also him coming at the eighth day. And what does it say? After these sayings. So if he's coming at about an eighth day, after these sayings, and within these sayings, it starts with the apostles that are returned and him feeding a group of people that relates to the upper room at the wedding and then him returning, as it says, and him now starting his 40 days. It strikes me again that the wedding of seven days actually does take place first. That's pretty interesting, right? <clears throat> We're starting to see this, this real true connection being possible that the bride goes first. And there's a remaining group. So when he comes at about an eight days, who had to be ready? Those he said when he returns from the wedding. Those he called his little flock. Those who we were told that when they invite guests or when they're doing these things, that their reward will come at the resurrection. Who were told as a little flock that their reward would be that the Father's going to give them the kingdom. Whoever these workers will be. I had a, I had a question from a brother <clears throat> I think it was earlier today or yesterday, who had said, well, what happens uh, from Brother James, what happens to those workers, the SEALs workers that die? Right? Where are they going to go? Are they going to go up and be allowed to go into heaven? Well, when we see in Revelation chapter 6, uh, at the fifth seal, those who are under the altar, those who are under the altar, I don't believe they're the same people. I don't believe they're the same people as the disciples. <clears throat> I believe the disciples may end up just remaining in their plot, right? Just like just like Daniel was told in the last verse of Daniel, just like uh, we see Abraham and and uh, and uh, uh, Lazarus being in the bosom of Abraham, <clears throat> they're waiting for the time of the resurrection. Their promised millennial reign, right? Their promised land, their promised peace, and. That is when that worker group is going, that's what that worker group is also going to be a part of. So I don't know if they're going to be up in heaven or what the case may be. Um, it's, it's hard to say. I don't really think it matters because once, you, once you've died in it, it's going to feel like minutes anyways because there's only what, you know, uh, what, 10 or so years left. It won't, it won't, it'll just pass by like a blink of an eye. So it won't be long at all because the day is as a thousand years, right? So um, so with that, um, this at this point here, when these guys are coming, well, I mean, when the Lord is coming, this is when it all starts. This is the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. And I believe that this right here is the Lord beginning his 40 days in the midst of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, just like we were told in John 7, which is directly connected to everything else pre-trib in that 40, 50-day portion of time. Right? What did he say? In the midst of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. Well, isn't that interesting? One of our brothers reminded me of it. Uh, our brother Brian had reminded me of this. And... It was this down here. Here's when Jesus begins his 40 days. We've, we've known it for a long time. We've done videos on it for a long time. And we now know it's confirmed to be in the midst of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. So let's see what it tells us. Uh, his countenance has changed. Starting in verse uh, Luke 9, verse 32. But Peter <coughs> and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with them. 
And it came to pass as they departed from him. I can't believe I forgot to talk about this when we were talking about the seventh month of the Jews last time. So uh, it says, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here and let us make the three tabernacles. Do you know when you build tabernacles, brothers and sisters? <laughs> At the time of the Jews' tabernacles, right? When did the Jews build tabernacles? At the time of tabernacles. And he's saying, let us build tabernacles. But then listen to what it says. One for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. But then listen to what it says. Not knowing what he said. Not knowing what he said. Do you know why not knowing what he said? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? At the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand, and Jesus shows up in the midst. They didn't build any tabernacles. They weren't building tabernacles, but what was it? <clears throat> it was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. This is the midst of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh year, which is John chapter 7, which is directly right here, which has to be before John 8 and the rest of it all begins. So what happens? He tells them what? Well, first of all, we know it's the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. Yet in Luke 9, Peter says, let us build tabernacles for you three. And Jesus says, or, or we're told that in his excitement, you could say, not knowing what he said. Now, is it not knowing what he said because because it was in the midst of the jews feast of tabernacles or was it not knowing what he said because he was just so frazzled he didn't know what to do he saw the lord there shining he sees moses and elijah i mean he's freaking out is that probably what it meant by not knowing what he said well there has to be more to it because when we go to mark's disc uh, uh mark's transfiguration story listen to what it says let us make in 9 verse 5, Mark 9 verse 5, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elias, for he wist not, so for he knew not what to say, for they were sore afraid. Do you know what it says in Matthew? Nothing. Nothing. Do you know why it would say nothing in Matthew? Watch this. Let us make three tabernacles, one for the other, Eliza, Elias, while he yet spake, a bright cloud overcame. See that? Nothing. There's no because they were terrified. There's no not knowing what he said. So in Luke's not knowing what he said, it lines up with the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, as Jesus said it, because it's not truly the Lord God's Feast of Tabernacles. They've got it wrong because they're off by two months. So at the time when the Lord comes in the midst of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, they're going to say, hey, let's build some tabernacles for you. <clears throat> right? Let's build some new ones. Not knowing what they're saying. Why? Well, he's going to be in Jerusalem, we know. But it's not really the Jew. It's not really the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles. It's the Jews. So when you get to the, when you get to Mark's, Mark is a representation of the end of seals. So the six years of seals has hap have happened. He's coming down on heavenly Mount Zion. And they say the same type of thing. And what does he tell them? For he knew not what to say, for they were sore afraid. It doesn't even mean it was tabernacles. He just didn't know what to say. And guess what? During seals, they're not going to know their dates and times properly. They're not going to know that everything was two months off so to 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 be doing it at the true time of tabernacles but do you know what happens by the time of matthew the, this is the end of seals the lord has come on heavenly mount zion mount zion is going to be in jerusalem over the mountains or however it's going to sit in the clouds whatever it's going to be the lord will have come by like light he's going to be shining exceedingly white because he's coming as light remember 
He came to save these people. This is the world, the lost sheep of the house of Israel that he's coming to save. But when it's over, what is he, he's going to be here? He's going to be here in Jerusalem. The rebuilding of the city and the temple and the streets are all going to take place. This is when he comes as light. Remember, after six years in that seventh year. Do you remember when we found this in, um, we just spoke about it the other day in Micah chapter seven. We showed how there was this, it, it's a it's a conversation of, of the times of seals and events that took place. But then he goes on to talk about now at the time of the seventh year, like Micah might even have uh, the first seven years like seals. And in verse nine, he says, and I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment uh, for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. Remember, we showed that this light is the light from Genesis verse one, uh, uh, chapter one, verse three. This is Jesus. So he's being brought to the light that is Jesus when he comes after six years of seals, which means in the seventh year of seals. And then the walls are going to be decreed to be built at the start of trumpets, you see? Or the, the decree that had been made is now going to start with the walls at the time of trumpets, like we shared in the last video. But what is he? He's light. Remember, we were talking about it earlier. Genesis 1, in the beginning, was the spirit. The second time was the light. So when he comes, it makes sense that Mike is talking about being brought to the light, being brought to the righteousness, which is the light. Because that was his creation, the world, right? It was the world. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 15. He told us that, verse 24, he says, And he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember, he, he didn't come for Judah. Judah had to be blinded. Who, who represents Israel? It's the church. It's, it's the house of Israel that's scattered throughout the earth, that mixed with the Gentiles. They're called the world. It is the Mark group. They're not ready. They're sleeping. He came for the lost sheep. He didn't come for the saved ones that have the spirit in them. They're already going to be taken. They're going to the wedding, the Gentile bride. And a group of little flock is remaining to work to help bring in his lost sheep of the house of Israel, who when he comes as light at the end of seals, is going to bring them in. That's the great multitude rapture. That's the group going to paradise. That's what he's doing in Mark. But guess what? They don't go right away, remember? They don't go right away. Do you remember how that worked? Let me show you that one real quick. This was so much fun. You guys remember that from Jeremiah? Um, our sister Rebecca found this from Jeremiah verse 8. Now, this is in the King James, but when you go to the Septuagint, the original translation, listen to what it says. From the, Greek, uh, from the Hebrew to the Greek, but this one's the King James. It says, Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth. And with them, the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child, together a great company, together a great multitude shall come thither. This is the reference to the rapture. We've talked about it many times. Now, why is this interesting? Because we know this happens in the seventh year of seals. We see that Rachel ends up, she's weeping, right? She's weeping because her children aren't part of it yet. And it relates to Joseph and to Benjamin, but Benjamin is connected with uh, Judah as well. So it's like Joseph with Judah. And look what happens. You'll remember when we taught on this because Jeremiah 31.8 being the great multitude rapture, 
check this out when you go to the septuagint the brenton septuagint look at what it says this is so exciting behold i bring them from the north and will gather them from the end of the earth to the feast of passover <laughs> and the people shall beget a great multitude and they shall return thither well remember in mark in uh in mark 9 they were also in fear talking about the time of tabernacles well we know from revelation chapter 7 the lord is seen at the end of the sixth seal coming right which is at the end of the six years of seals the 144,000 are sealed first and they're going to help bring in the great multitude rapture with those see with those seals workers that are left over and here it is here's that great multitude which no man can number right some were dead the majority were still alive it still survived when do we know they come in well the lord is returning six years later so it's going to be connected to some time around tabernacles or their believed time of tabernacles what's seven months later right that's six to seven months later if it's first or second passover it's when the great multitude comes in so the great multitude is revealed right here in the septuagint coming in at passover and we know that's the second one that goes to paradise the place that he went and prepared for them and they're going to be brought in at passover in the seventh year of seals so about six is months, right? I think we say about seven months into the seventh year of seals. So all of these incredible little connections to it. And when you go to Matthew's, <clears throat> in Matthew 17, and you see the transfiguration story, again, the story is spoken to of slightly differently. There is no mix up of saying, oh, they did it in fear. There's no mix up of saying, oh, uh, uh, they didn't know what they were saying. It goes into just say, let us build you three tabernacles. And the reason I went down that path with the Lord being here at the end of seals and during the first half of trumpets is do you think during the time of trumpets while the Lord is here that you're still going to be observing um, tabernacles and trumpets and all those things in the improper way? Of course not. It'll be done properly. There won't be any fear in just blurting it out because it wasn't the right time or not understanding that it wasn't the right time. It will be taking place at the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles. So it'll be right on target. It'll be right where it's supposed to be. There's other things we see here now too. Now remember when I said that things are prophetic, right? When you understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you see this prophetic imagery throughout all the gospels and we as we've said you see it a lot in the transfiguration and all these other ones i said well listen to what it says here it does not say this in matthew i mean it does not say this in mark and it does not say this in luke <clears throat> and i can show it to you in matthew 17 verse 9 again the transfiguration story still it says after them having seen all these things of the lord coming listen to what he tells them and as they came down from the mountain jesus charged them saying tell the vision to no man until the son of man be risen again from the dead again from the dead we've talked about it numerous times right well we never really noticed this before. It says, tell the vision to no man. Remember I told you it was all prophetic? You can find prophecy all throughout the Gospels revealing the is to come. And if Matthew is the final seven years of trumpets, then he's telling them what? He's literally telling them prophetically in the vision that they saw to tell nobody until he rise again from the dead look at the word vision 
gaze at something, right? At a spectacle. Even though it's used 12 times, check this out. It's used 12 times. Is this the word? In all of the Gospels, <clears throat> the Lord decides to use that word one time in all of the Gospels. One time. Isn't that telling? He tells them it's a vision for the end when he's going to rise again from the dead. So don't tell anybody of this vision that you've just experienced. As if it didn't happen. Do you guys realize how many times we have gone into the scriptures of Matthew and it sometimes doesn't even seem like it happened? We've had these conversations before, even when you go into the Gospel of John. It, it, when you're reading it, they're so different that you almost wonder if it actually happened. Because when you have your end time understanding, once you could see with end time eyes, <laughs> so much opens in the prophetic meaning in them that you sometimes wonder if it actually took place. You see, you can go to the one in Mark and remember, who does Mark represent? The ones Jesus came for all the way back from the creation of days when he was light. He came to save these people that were lost. And so guess what? Look at what the conversation says for him. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what they had seen. See? what they had seen. So what they knew, what they saw, what they knew. Not a vision of the future. He literally says, tell them, uh, um, tell no man uh, what they had seen. Tell the son of man were risen from the dead. He did rise from the dead, did he not? Tell uh, the son of man were risen from the dead. What did Matthew say again? Don't tell them about the vision, which is a vision, which is prophetic. Don't tell them about the vision. You see, because it's supernatural, because it's a vision, it's prophetic. Don't tell them the vision of no man until the Son of Man be risen again. Again <laughs> from the dead. Do you think it's just a typo? I always remember our brother Mark, he would say when he was little, he used to always ask his, or he'd ask his dad when he was little, dad, why does it say again? Right? Because even as a kid, you realize the word again means to do something over. It means to repeat it. We've taught on it so many times, right? So many great little connections here. So now let's go back as we were talking about these things with luke so backing up to to luke's discord uh luke's um uh, uh whether we're, we were talking about the this disciple group being called his little flock or given the kingdom uh whether they were the ones at the at the the banquet story and when they invite people over we can see they're different than the ones that go in the highest room did you catch that that was the point I was getting at here, is that this group going to the wedding is a separate group from this group that is calling the lame, the maimed, the blind, and everybody else to feast who will be rewarded at the resurrection. This group is the same group as we were saying in Luke 12, those that were his, his little flock those that were going to suffer and, and be persecuted and not worry about what to eat or drink or don't worry about any of those things. It'll be taken care of. The Father is going to give you the kingdom. And then tells them, so be ready when I return from the wedding and I will come in and I will feed and I will eat with you. <coughs> Who's he eating with? Right? Who's having this feast? These guys that are eating. And we could see that there's a group goes to the upper room that is part of the guests. We went to Luke chapter 12, uh, Luke chapter 9, and we saw the above eight days 
because it said about an eight days after these things, which means the conversation from the apostles showing up forward was a conversation that happened eight days earlier, which ties into the time of the wedding, which makes sense that now when he comes, it's about an eight days later from when he had said those things. And not only is he meeting with the the apostles one more time, he is also now going to be hanging out and those disciples are going to start following him. There is this separation between these two groups. And I know some people in this ministry believe they've been revealed that they're going to be a worker. Well, then get ready because you're not going to the wedding. It certainly does not appear that the workers are going to the wedding. They're going to remain. They're going to be prepared. They're going to be empowered when he returns. He is going to be in their presence. They will follow him for 40 days and will receive the Holy Ghost anointing on day 50. And then they're going to go out from Jerusalem, preaching and teaching all sorts of things throughout the time of seals in the midst of incredible persecution and death. But like he warned them in Luke 12, fear not the one who can put your body in the ground, who can kill the body, but fear the one who once the body is dead can send the soul to hell. Yikes. That's his conversation. That's his warning and his talk that he's giving to the disciple workers. Now, who are these disciple workers? <clears throat> Remember, I told you I would also share <clears throat> to give you an idea of who these disciple workers are. Well, I've said it many times that they're, they're a part of the bride. They're also called his friends, right? Now, when I say a part of the bride, they're, they're a part of that bride group that goes pre-trib, okay? But they are remaining. They have been chosen. They have been informed. They, they've been given understanding. And they will know beyond a shadow of a doubt. If they knew back 2,000 years ago, I can guarantee you they're going to know when the time comes too. Because the Lord will make it known. Because we're now talking about the beginning of the end of days starting. Not just the beginning of Christianity, which was so difficult and persecuting and everything else. This is all that times 100 because it's the end of days. It'll be as it never has been since the beginning of the world. That's how crazy it's going to get. You see? So it's not going to be, oh, I think this or, oh, I think that. Oh, I wonder if I le I'm left. Oh, I wonder if I'm going to be working for the Lord. It isn't going to be that. You're going to know. Because the Lord will either be present to reveal himself to you and maybe you'll be gathered somewhere or you're going to be at the wedding feast. At the wedding. So the Lord will instruct. A group is going to go and another group is small group. A little flock is going to remain. They're going to be aware. They're going to be empowered. They're going to be strengthened because they had just been with the Lord. They're going to know it, and when he returns, they're going to be empowered by following him and then receive the Holy Ghost. So, who is this first group? Who does Luke really represent as the bride of Christ? Right? As that gorgeous white robe? Well, she's called the Gentile bride, is she not? So, if she's the Gentile bride, this connection relates to the Gentiles. Right? This, this portion that has the Spirit in them. Now, Gentiles, meaning, you know, the world, uh, the house of Israel could be in there as well. Of course they can, because the, they come out of something. They're 10% of the church. They're the ready 10% first fruits going to the Lord. So this little group is also connected to Gentiles. And I can prove it. Watch this. As I bring this to an end with this. Remember this? 
I was showing you guys this earlier for those of you that are new. Here they are. Acts 15. So what is Acts 15 representative? Right near the beginning of the 14 years, like right at the start of the beginning of tribulation. Right at the start. And listen to what it says. Starting in verse, uh, yeah, let's start right in verse 15 and keep going <coughs> to verse 15. So it says in Acts 15, starting in verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea and taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas no small uh, had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas, that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and the elders about this question as to whether these people, <clears throat> whether this group of people, you're going to find out who they are, whether they should be circumcised. And being brought on the way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things <coughs> that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. Verse 7. And when they had been much, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us <coughs> that the Gentiles by my mouth should bear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, and bear them, the Gentiles, witness, giving them, the Gentiles, the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. We well, see Peter was what? Peter was one of the apostles. There's that conversation, the apostles, and we know when the apostles received that empowering of the Holy Ghost. That was when the Lord came on day one of the 50. But these disciples, these guys received the Holy Ghost when? On the 50th day by the Holy Ghost. And he's saying, And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. So all of the them and, and, and they are talking about the Gentile disciples who the Pharisees and these guys think should be circumcised and be abiding by the law of Moses, by the Torah. And the, the, disciple, uh, the apostles are standing up for these Gentile disciples. And here's what Peter goes on to say in verse 9. And he put no difference between us and them, the Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? Hello. They're trying to put a yoke upon the neck of them who are the Gentiles now being told to us that they're the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Right? Christ through faith, not through all of these things of the Torah. So Paul, Peter's saying, look, we couldn't even bear these things. Neither could our fathers. And you're going to stick them on the Gentile disciples who don't even understand these things? Verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Well, 
don't forget the miracles and wonders that are going to happen during the 40 days. When the Gentiles were following him, who then received the anointing of the Holy Ghost on day 50. And they're talking about these wonders and miracles that these Gentile disciples did and received. And how they got the Holy Spirit. Who are the disciples? Who are the disciple workers being referenced here? The Gentile workers who followed Christ during the 40 days and received the Holy Ghost. Listen how he clears it up. Going on in verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first, firstly, in the beginning, or at the beginning, did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. How many times have we shared this piece of scripture? How God did at the first visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Who told them? Simeon told them. When? Simeon knew about the visitation. Well, how about we go look at that? It's all related to Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, which we know is the beginning at the at the uh, um, beginning of the, the 50 days, the eighth day of the circumcision. And when we come down here, it says in verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. This is the one referencing, saying that what? He has visited and redeemed his people. Who did he redeem? Those who are his from among the Gentiles. And then what happens? Who's this Simeon that told the apostles about it? Well, here's the story, right? 40 days of the Son of Man in the typology of his birth. And what do we get in verse 25? And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was a just and devout uh, was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The Lord's here for 40 days, which means what? Didn't Simeon die? Would Simeon have to have died after this or shortly after? But he told them, hey, when the Lord came, he's going to visit the Gentiles first and take out a people for his name. In Acts 15, which is the beginning of tribulation, these guys are going back and forth about these Gentile disciple workers who have been chosen and sealed by the Holy Ghost for the Lord to work during the time of seals. And they want to try to put the burden of the Old Testament on them. And Paul and Barnabas and Peter and these guys are saying, no way, not these guys. We couldn't even bear it. Don't you dare put it on them. They received the same spirit we did. They were part of the miracles and wonders. Don't you remember? Simeon declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out a people for his name. He's now recapping what happened before these guys came on board? That God had taken out a people for his name. <clears throat> and what does this relate to? The very famous one we've talked about many times in Second Esdras, which is awesome. You see, in, uh, in I think it's chapter 13, look in verse 44. When he stops the channels of water until they had passed over. Why? Because it's going to be the time of Passover at the great multitude rapture. But where is the pre-trib escape? Right here. Verse 29. Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth and bewilderment of mine shall come over those who dwell on the earth and they shall plan to make war against each other, nation against nation, city against city. Why? What's going on during this bewilderment? What's going on during this planning? 
the 40 days of the Son of Man. Because it's not till the second seal that it's nation against nation. This is the beginning of the 14 years when it goes nation against nation. It is at the Red Horse Rider, which is um, the lion and the bear, starting with the lion, attacking Jerusalem, and then the bear coming in in World War III beginning. Did you catch all that? <laughs> Guys, the Gentiles are the workers. The Gentiles were portioned from the Gentile bridegroom portion to go to the wedding. They will be the ones putting their necks on the line in the typology of Priscilla and Aquila, like, like Dan and Ephraim. I believe they will be two sets of 12,000. It could be more, though. And they will follow the Lord during 40 days. They will receive the anointing. They will be his little flock. They will inherit the kingdom. Could you imagine? Could you imagine what's coming for everybody that's going to work as a, as a worker during seals? Putting their necks on the line and will be raised to rule and reign and live with him for a thousand years to be part of the first resurrection? This is the reward for the Gentile worker little flock that the Lord said, be ready when I return after the wedding, which is seven days of the wedding. <clears throat> and why is this important? Because I believe in the revelation of what we're understanding here. I believe it's highly possible now that the bride is gone on day one. He meets also with the apostles, anoints them, and informs the worker group disciples to be ready when he returns from the wedding after seven days on the eighth day. And I believe Psalms 18 is going to take place during that week. And the group that is rescued and has power and will follow with him from Psalms 18 is this group right here that will be rescued when he comes riding on a cherub. And isn't that interesting that it's on a cherub because the cherubs are the one that surround the throne of Jesus because it's the seraphim, as we know, that surround the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, I hope that blesses you. I hope you were able to see those connections and and this typology, this this playing out in particular from Luke chapter 12 within most of the chapter, within Luke chapter 9 most of the chapter, with, with Luke chapter 14, and these connections to Luke 24 that we've understood. I think it's highly probable and very possible, brothers and sisters, that the bride of Christ does escape at the beginning of the 50 days, and that Luke chapter 12, when the Lord himself tells his little flock to be ready when he returns from the wedding, is because that is precisely the case. The attack of Jerusalem, or the attack on Israel will come, the escape of the bride of Christ, the stones throw in here, the Lord arriving, and those told remaining to be ready, receiving the understanding and being with the Lord from the midst of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles in this time frame here. We are in the 70th year, brothers and sisters. The evidence is clear. I want you guys to understand this as I finish up here in these last couple minutes. I really want it to sink in. And those who have watched to the end and who watch all these videos to the end, which is less than 25% of all views anyways, um, because I get the stats. I know you guys already understand this, but I want you to let this really, really sink in. It certainly can't be the beginning of the 14 years on the Hebrew calendar. It can't even be one month off, as probably a bunch of people might be saying, 
because one month off still doesn't leave 40 or 50 days. We have been given the revelation of Taurus for two and a half years. And at every turn, it has grown and revealed more and more and more connection to the true understanding of his count to the point where we know even the Jews know it. <laughs> and here we are counting it out as the only group on earth realizing that we're still in the 70th still in the seventh year Shemitah of the 70th and that the 50-day count is right in here because two months off is the beginning of Tishri on the Hebrew calendar the first of Kislev brothers and sisters I hope it sinks in I hope we are ready I don't even know what more we can do we will continue to bring revelation and, and tying in scripture and sharing things until to prepare everyone the best we can. But I don't even know what more we can do except gather together and share and keep digging in him. Keep watching and praying. There's no other 70th in all of scripture. Zero. And if it wasn't for the revelation of being two months off because of Taurus revelation, I'd be pulling my hair out right now. This is it. And I can't wait to meet you. Whether now and we're working together or whether in heaven at the wedding feast, brothers and sisters, I look forward to meeting you all very, very soon. Because you see, there's also a special group. You saw that in, in Luke in Luke 9? That was a special group that got to go into that upper room. I'm not saying we're that special group. What I wanted you guys to see was there's a distinguish now. There's a distinguishing between those going to the wedding compared to the worker group that remains, that the worker group that remains isn't that special group that gets that special upper room. The workers will remain, and that is simply a special group that the Lord has chosen Throughout all of those going to the wedding banquet, I mean, going to the wedding, there's a special group that the Lord is bringing up to that room. So if we're going to the wedding, sit in the lowest room. And if you're working, let your hearts be burning, let your, let your, let, be girded, ready, and your lights burning, brothers and sisters, because we are only days away. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. I look forward to meeting you all so very, very soon. Love you all. Bye for now.